Well, welcome to another episode, another year, the beginning of another year, the sixth year of 9-11 was an inside job. We also tacked on the uh, SCADS part of it behind us there when we get it up. Uh, the state crimes against democracy. But anyway, today we've got several things that we're going to do. Um, one of the things that I wanted to talk about is the fact that when we, you know, we always get together and we talk about how are we going to let people know about 9-11, how do we get them to know why that's important. Uh, and then you take a look, I have some films of Fred Meyer Books Center looking at their recommended books. I'm not going to show them because it's just, you know, I want to save some time for calls at the end of the show. But they had nothing but establishment books. There wasn't one single book about 9-11 or by any of the, the so-called alternative authors, so-called 9-11 truth authors uh, I mean you don't have any choice at the public outlets <clears throat> um, so our history is also rewritten daily as we go and uh, that brings us to the first clip we're going to put up the uh, the first clip is Amy Martin clip Russia Today from Breaking the Set you can see that behind me um, she interviews uh, Oliver Stone the well-known and award-winning uh, movie producer. Uh, Oliver Stone will kind of correct some of the mistaken history that we have. You know, let's, let's just start with this one. Uh, this is about 15 minutes, so enjoy. And then I'll come back and I have one more clip before we open up the phones. But this, this is a great one to kick off the very first of the year. <laughs> So last week I had the great pleasure of having Academy Award winning director Oliver Stone and historian Peter Kuznick on the show. They were here to talk about their new Showtime series and book called The Untold History of the United States. But the part you didn't see is the discussion we had after that interview, in which I got their opinion on Obama's policies, the current state of play in the United States. Take a look. So it took both of you four years to produce this series and, and almost book. five. Almost five. Um, and in it, you have a chapter called Obama: Management of a Wounded Empire, where you give a, a harsh critique of the Obama administration. What, in your eyes, has been the most troubling aspects of his presidency, Oliver? Well, I think that uh, under the disguise of uh, a sheep's clothing, he's been a wolf. <laughs> Uh, that because the nightmare of the Bush presidency that preceded him, people forgave him a lot. He was a great hope for change. The color of his skin, the upbringing, the internationalism, the globalism seemed all evident. And he's an intelligent man. But he has taken all the uh, Bush changes and he's basically put them into the establishment. He's codified them. That's what's sad. So we're going into a second administration that has living outside the law and does not respect the law as a foundation of our of our system and he is a constitutional lawyer uh, you know without the law there is a, it's a law of the jungle you see Nuremberg existed for a reason after the and there was a reason to have trials there's a reason for a due process habeas, habeas corpus they call it in the United States do you yeah. agree? <laughs> I agree totally. Yeah. Uh, if you look at his domestic policy, he didn't break with the Wall Street friendly, friendly policies of the Bush administration. If you look at his uh, transparency, he claimed to be the transparency president when he was running for office. There hasn't been transparency. We've been actually classifying more documents under Obama than we did under Bush. All previous presidents between 1917 and 2008 indicted three people total under the Espionage Act. Obama has already indicted six people under the Espionage Act. The surveillance hasn't stopped. And the incarcerations without uh, bringing people to trial have, hasn't stopped. So th those policies have continued. And then the war policies and the militarization policies, we maintain that. We're fighting wars now in Yemen, uh, Afghanistan. We're talking about keeping troops in Afghanistan. We haven't cut back on the things that we all found so odious of the Bush, about the Bush administration, and Obama's added some of his own. The drones policy, Obama had more drone attacks in his first eight months than Bush had his entire presidency. And these are a very, very dubious international law legality. Uh, and Peter's more hopeful on the second term that it would, yeah. there would be some more flexibility. We hope so, but 
there is a system in place that is enormous, the, uh, the Pentagon system. Yeah, it's almost seems, it almost seems like you took the you know the, the odious CIA policies and just branded them. So it's now acceptable that the assassinations, the extrajudicial judge, jury, executioner of, of people right. without due process. It's it's fascinating. I mean, um, we complained during the Bush years that Bush was actually conducting surveillance without judicial review. <laughs> surveillance. Obama's killing people, targeted assassinations without judicial review. That to us is obviously much more serious. Absolutely. Um, you know, and, and, and until the history, you cover Pearl Harbor, which of course led to the internment of Japanese American citizens. I don't think a lot of people really acknowledge that. Once again, a, an underreported aspect of really what that meant. When you look at the surveillance grid in America today, it, it almost seems like it is an open air internment camp where they don't need to intern people anymore because we have this grid set up in place. What, yeah. what do you guys think the, about the, that? The, the, we, the U.S. government now intercepts more than 1.7 billion messages a day from American citizens. 1.7 billion. That's email, that's telephone calls, that's other forms of communication. Can you imagine that? 1.7 billion? We've got this apparatus set up now with hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people, over a million people with top security clearances. We've created this kind of nightmarish state. This is a 1984 kind of state in many ways. We say, well, well five is million, trustworthy. Five million uh, clearances, one million top, top security, security clearances. Top security, That's yeah. a pretty heavy number. In other words, we are living in a fishbowl. And I think the sad part is that kids, the younger people, accept it. Uh, they're used to invading. They don't say, well, you know. And it's true. I mean, how can we follow the lives of everybody? But the truth is that we're all ultimately watching ourselves. It is an Orwellian state. It's, it may not be op oppressive on the surface, but in our hearts we have to have a certain. We, there's no place to hide. There's no. Uh, there's really no place to hide. You, you, some part of you is going to end up in a database somewhere. And it can become oppressive on the surface. One of the things we feared after 9/11 was that if there was a second terrorist attack like 9/11, the Constitution would be gone. I mean, we, the crackdown would be so egregious at that point, and and there's still this obsessive fear. The United States fears things. We fear the rest of the world. We spend as much money on our military security intelligence as the rest of the world combined. You know, do we have enemies? Are we really so threatened? Do we really need this anymore? Is that what our priorities should be? And we think not. We'd want to turn that around. Yeah, the evisceration of the rule of law, especially, you know, most notably the, the National Defense Authorization Act, which, which eradicates due process and our basic fundamental freedom in this country. The, um, I wanted to also bring up another interesting point that really struck me in the in the film series, which was the kamikaze pilots who, uh, you know, they were brave. They were considered it was the bravest act that you could do. And then it just I can't help but think of suicide bombers today. Yeah. And you know, Bill Maher he goes out and loses his show for saying these people are brave. And then you have people like Ron Paul get up there and talk about blowback as a reality. And he's he's ridiculed. I mean, how do we get here where the discourse is just so dumbed down where we can't even acknowledge obvious truths such as that? Primitive discourse. Yeah. Uh, there's been a worship, a blind worship of the military and patriotism, jingoism that used to be called. Uh, I, you know, I, I strongly believe in a good military and a strong military, but to defend our country, not to invade other countries and to con try to conquer the world. And I think there's a huge difference and it's been forgotten. Morality. If once you take the law away, as Einstein once said famously, if a country doesn't obey its laws, the laws will be disrespected. So it seems that we, a fundamental morality has been lost on us somewhere along the way recently. And it's, it's who wins. It's what's effective. Can we kill bin Laden without having to bring him to trial? Can we just get it done? And that get it done mentality justifies the ends. And that's where countries go wrong, people go wrong. All our lives are moral equations. Does the end justify the means? No, it never did. And the other side of what you're asking is about the constraints upon political discourse in this country. Why are people so uninformed? It's what we're trying to deal with in this series. If people don't understand their history, then they don't have any vision of the future and what's possible. If they think that the now, what exists now, this tyranny of now, is all that is possible, then they can't dream about the future. They can't imagine a future that's different from the present. That's why we're saying people have to understand their past, because if you understand the past, if you study the past the way we're presenting it, then you can envision a future that's actually very, very different. And we've come very close on many occasions to going a very different direction in the future. We came very close in 1944, 1945. 
1945 to avoiding the atomic bombing and potentially maybe not having the kind of Cold War that we had. We came very close in 1953 upon Stalin's death to ending the Cold War. We came close in 1963 when Kennedy was assassinated to ending the war in Vietnam, ending the Cold War, having a very different direction. The early Carter years, again, was a possibility of a different direction. And at the end of the Cold War, in 1989, uh, Gorbachev was reaching out to Bush. Did Bush take that olive branch that Gorbachev was giving him? No. Very much different. What do we do instead? We applaud the Soviets for not invading when countries were liberating themselves from the Soviet Union. And then we immediately go and we invade Panama. And then we invade Iraq. And so we're saying that that's great. We, that's great that you show restraint, but we're not going to because we're the hegemon. As, as Madeleine Albright, Secretary of State, under Clinton says, if the United States use for if we use forces because we're the United States of America, we're the indispensable nation, she said. We see farther and stand taller than other nations. That's the attitude that Oliver and I are challenging, the sense of American exceptionalism. The United States is the city upon the hill, God's gift to humanity. If we do it, it's right. And that's not acceptable. It's very funny because we go from, you know, we, we've been, the book has been out a few weeks. Uh, the series has been playing for the fifth week now and it will be 10 weeks and all. We go to TV shows and we sit in these uh, beautiful sets and they're always rushing and rushing in. They got news here, they got news in, in Gaza, they got Petraeus, they got uh, Obama. Okay, well, what are you talking about? Oh, history, you know. Oh, okay, well, history, that's, what does that have to do with today? But okay, what's your point? So you, you sit there very patiently and it's very bizarre to me, I don't know about you, but you know, well, honey, uh, the past is prologue. You know, this has all happened before. Right. All you're running around, all you're being busy, your ratings. And, this is this is history. This is all it happened before, and if you're smart, you'll see it all, perhaps more calmly, and you won't overreact to these situations. The United States of amnesia. Of course, if it all said, and of course, yeah. if we don't understand history, we are doomed to repeat it as we are. Time you could also again. argue that that media is driven uh, by by dollars, the greed. You know, we, we're going back to our Wall Street theme. Is you know, you have a show. And you, it's not really a news show because it's really about ratings. It's mm -hmm. how many people watch it. And the only way you can get that going is with a lot of speed and a lot of zoom and a lot of fancy sets and, and people watch and then keep it moving. Don't think, keep it moving. That's why it's so nice to do a show like this where we can actually discuss the issues in a little more depth, a little more critically. But if you both were to make a film about this generation right now, what's one facet that you think is, is the most underreported? or misrepresented? I don't know about the younger generation. I have three children. Uh, I think that it's an eternal story to some degree. I think people, no matter what their fashions and their, they do have a similar uh, morality and consciousness and uh, patterns reemerge again and again. Uh, the young man, the young woman wants to make a way in the world and they go about it and, and it's not that far off than what we went through. So I see, I believe in cyclical history and I believe that my children are going through what I went through and what my father and mother went through too. I think there's, I always look for those patterns first, beyond and before the superficiality mm -hmm. set in. I find with my students, and I deal with the kids that age all the time, college students and graduate students, and they care really passionately about what's going on in the world. They're all doing lots of volunteer work. What I found in this generation, unlike Oliver and I, my generation, is that they treat the symptoms. They're not asking the questions about what's the root cause of all these problems. So they care, they try to change things, they try to reform things, but it's more superficial. And what we're challenging them to do is look at the patterns. Look what's happened from the 1890s all the way through to today. Look at the consistency of the wars, the interventions, the military expenditures, the paranoia, the fear of outsiders, the repression, and, and get at the root. What's really causing that? What's making the system as a whole sick in certain ways and how can we root out those deeper causes and how we understand that and begin to change that. The Occupy movement did some of that. There have been times in the 1930s, the 1870s and 80s, the 1960s when people were challenging it on that scale. We want the country to begin thinking those big questions again. What is our past? How did we get here? What are the possibilities for the future? What have we done wrong? And what can we get right? Yeah. I mean, are, do you think these superficialities and the conventional wisdom that we hear are p perpetuated to keep us in a perpetual state of war, like the, the tentacle, you know, kind of the, the surveillance apparatus, the military-industrial complex, in order to keep that running? 
Is that why these broader... Fahrenheit 451, yeah. you know, you got the television walls and people and the jets are flying off and nobody even pays any attention. Uh, I don't know if it's quite so deliberate by, on the part of Ailes and company at Fox, but that seems to be the effect, dumbing down the population to the point where they can't think critically, and then you can pull anything over their eyes. They've got a five-minute attention span and a five-minute memory of what happened in the past. We're saying learn your history, study this, and think about what the alternatives are. Think deeply. Think utopian. Think of utopian ways about how different the world could be and how much better it could be if we start to organize it rationally in the interest of people, not in the interest of profit, not in the interest of Wall Street, not in the interest of the military, but the interest of our common humanity, the six billion of us who occupy this planet. What an amazing concept to entertain, and I hope that we see that in this lifetime thing. It's an ambitious series. I hope, uh, I hope, I think, I'm hoping that it will go on through time. I based it, the model of it was The World at War, which was made by the BBC in the 1970s about the world of World War II. And uh, it was a beautifully done thing. I like this series, which is cut with a lot of care. I mean, it's like, these are ten feature films, like one hour each. It's cut with a lot of love. No talking heads, pure narration, mm. music, beautiful music, and sometimes clips of films that make our point or don't make our point right. in another way. But we, we, we try to keep it flowing like a, like a young person could enjoy it like a movie. I'm glad you did. Yeah, beautiful archival footage as well mixed in with, with the yeah. cinematic um, accents. It's a really incredible series, and thank you so much for your time, thank you. your cousin and and thank you. Oliver Stone. Abby, you're terrific. Thank you so much. If you like what you see so far, go to our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash bring a set and subscribe. Check out our Facebook page. Okay, I, I let her get that little little thing in before I shut it down there. Uh, definitely go to uh, the YouTube page, Breaking the Set, that's Amy Martin. And boy, she sticks, she has a passion for the truth and she expresses the outrage we all feel. That's, that's the best way I can describe her show. I really like it. And, and they were very gracious to let me show clips from her show. So, in that light, I'm going to show one more clip from her show. And, you know, in, in the Orwellian sense, we really are well past 1984 now with, with Windows computers that won't turn on if you have the camera covered with a piece of tape. How about that? You know, how about the new laptops that you have to have your thumbprint and that thumbprint gets transferred to who knows where in the cloud. So anyway, I mean, it, it's it's nuts. And here's an example. Uh, like, Facebook.com slash breaking the set. Yeah, and if you're wondering about what sorry. I'm doing when I'm not on it. Uh, I blew that one. But no, just <laughs> let me switch to the show that I, that I had set up. And uh, this one is... Yeah, all of a sudden it wasn't ready, but here we go. I'll make it full screen. Go ahead and put it up behind me. And there there we are. Oh, yeah. This is Amy Martin again, and they're talking about the, the sinister toys, we call them toys, that the government has built. And they're not going to use them against enemies primarily. They're going to use them against the American people. You want to know why 9-11 was so important? It was to send us down this path. Here we go. Uh, you didn't have to bring me back. <laughs> uh, but anyway, let me start this thing. <laughs> Well, guys, it's been a long year of data mining, surveillance, tracking, and spying. Big Brother seems to be rearing its ugly head around every corner of planet Earth. As you may notice, on this show, I try to give a regular update on the expansion of the surveillance state. In 2012, has seen an enormous growth of every kind of technology capable of dropping eaves that the government cannot wait to seize and use against you and me. So to help me go over the top five creepiest elements of the surveillance state, join me now is my own Breaking the Set producer, Manuel Rapolo. Hi, hi, Abby. Hi, hi, hi. How's it going? Um, great. So let's go over the list really quickly. Uh, number five. Buses with surveillance cameras, um, that's kind of something that we already knew was going on. Number four, iPhone app 
E tracker, we'll go over what that means. Uh, number three, RFID chips. Number two, the crazy handcuffs that administer drugs and also can tase you. Number one, mannequins that have facial recognition technology. Wow. So let's start with the buses with surveillance cameras. This is something that isn't as surprising. Um, I think that just the implications of having surveillance cameras in every bus really just does administer that chilling effect where people are going to, um, of course, act differently, react differently when they know that there's a camera there. Absolutely. And this isn't something that's going on all over the country, but it's one of those things that kind of starts with school systems. And I don't think that there's a school system in the, uh, a county in the country that isn't at least, you know, thinking about putting these surveillance cameras in school buses. But I think that the larger implications of this is what's scary. You know, buses are public uh, places, just like parks and streets. So we're talking about buses and street lights and, 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 um, and lamps outside that can listen in on your conversations and watch what you're doing. It kind of sets the precedent for uh, this kind of public data mining and we all kind of uh, are, are exposed to it. And, and the fact that we all have you know, cell phones in our pockets, we willingly kind of give up all, all of our privacy and all of our information for this kind of public data mining so that the government can build this like large digital profile yeah. of us. So they can retroactively pull from also the, the lights like you brought up, those those lights that are being administered where they can yell commands at you and, and Don't also cross record the you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's talk about the surveillance app. This is something that is really disturbing. Can you explain really quickly yeah, what this is? This one actually uh, I found pretty creepy. This is a this is just one example is the uh, e-phone tracker, which is only $50. You can purchase this app. Uh, essentially what it does, you can um, actually originally develop for parents who are wanting to buy cell phones for their kids, keep track of what their kids are up to, just kind of track their location if that's not creepy enough. Um, but you can turn this around and do it to your spouse, mm -hmm. uh, do it to your significant other. And the app goes completely undetected on a person's phone. You get an email that will give you uh, emails that they sent from their phone. Uh, SMS text messages that they sent from their and phone. And even that they've deleted. Even the ones that they've that deleted. Contacts that they've added to their phone. I mean, you have literally a, a ton of information. You can build an entire profile on someone on this app. It's only $50 and it's completely legal. That is absolutely insane. Absolutely. I mean, seriously, that's just such a violation of your privacy. And, and you're right, you could do it to your significant other, you could do it to pretty much anything. It's terrible. Yeah. It's a terrible thing. And this <laughs> is commercialized. This is commercialized. The fact that this technology it's is available. You know? <laughs> um, so let's talk about the RFID chips. This is also something that's just kind of bizarre. I mean, first it, first it's pets, you know, tracking your pets. What is it going to be next? Installing chips in babies when they're born. I mean, we know that they're in school IDs. It, it's just so amazing to me that we we are, we're carrying around uh, passports when we travel, licenses. I mean, everything's going to have RFID chips. And we just, and our phones, like you yeah. said before, I mean, we're willingly giving up these tracking devices. We're just carrying them around with us. The telescreen is our cell phone now. Exactly. I mean, uh, our cell phones, our smartphones are today's telescreen, if you, you yeah. know, remember the, the Orwellian idea. Uh, but I think with, with RFID chips, I think luckily with this one, it's one of those things that's so costly uh, for school systems to use. This is kind of a de deterrent from doing it. But I mean, in coming years, this sort of technology is just going to get uh, less and less expensive. So it's only a matter of time. We might be seeing it next year or in the coming years. I am undoubtedly certain that we're going to start seeing this become kind of a, a regular occurrence. People, mm -hmm. uh, we're all, like you said, injecting our, our pets with these tracking chips. It's only a matter of time before we start doing it uh, to our children and, and each other. Why not just treat them like other. cattle, Manny? Uh, <laughs> let's talk about the taser drug surveillance handcuffs. I couldn't even make this up if I wanted to. It's handcuffs that can administer a drug. It can also tase you. I mean, seriously. There it is. is. There, there it is. is. This is this is an actual patent of these of these handcuffs. This uh, these handcuffs uh, may, may very well be the handcuffs of the future. You can administer a shock. Uh, there is an accelerometer similar to what you find on your cell phone. Uh, there is uh, biometrics. To, you know, to see how your health is doing. There's a microphone in there, or a GPS in there, and the kicker: it can administer drugs right into your bloodstream. It's like the Swiss Army knife of handcuffs. Of I mean, handcuffs. really, it's not enough to just detain someone. You have to drug them and tase them at the same time. I can just picture people just <laughs> riding on the ground getting tased and, and drugged by these handcuffs. It just Don't seems tase like, slash like, drugs drug. slash detain <laughs> slash Let's whatever move on though. Though. Let's move on though because there's, we have a, only a limited, limited time left and I wanted to go over this. This is the most disturbing thing ever. These mannequins now. I mean, hi, welcome to Minority Report. Yeah, no, these mannequins absolutely are very, very creepy. They're developed by a company called uh, IC and what they do, you can't ah. really see them. They're right. <laughs> the camera has ah. got facial recognition software built right into the eye. Uh, it can determine a person's age and race. Um, they're actually currently developing audio software so that you can actually, uh, you know, 
determine certain keywords while you're in the store. And it's exactly like you said. It's like Minority Report, that scene where uh, Tom Cruise's mm -hmm. character is walking through the mall, getting pitched all these ads based That's what's on... That's going to happen to exactly, us. Exactly. Every like that you make on Facebook, every time that you uh, geo-track yourself... And it's, it's all, not just like the algorithms that you encounter online when you, you know, if you search for something uh, more than something else and you get those ads, of course. This is going to be real time, real life, walking around department stores. These mannequins are going to be tracking you. Um, also, just uh, recording what you are talking to with your friend. I want to buy this shirt. I might want to go on this trip. And they sell those things to you. It's just unbelievable, Manny. Yeah, no, I completely, I completely agree. The thing that worries me is when you apply this sort of technology to the public sphere and you have facial recognition cameras that are very easily hidden in a place like a tree at a park that has uh, audio software that can uh, you know, pick out keywords. We're already seeing this sort of uh, technology in effect in our social media when you're on Twitter. There's no hiding it anymore. Unfortunately, we're out of time. Thank you so much for coming on. Really creepy. Big <laughs> Brothers watching you always. Thanks, Manny. Thanks, Abby. Okay, we're we're back again, and with me is Marcella from. Uh, you tell them. Oh well, I'm, I well, I'm with the Portland Surprise. chapter. I'm with the Portland chapter of Architects. Well, we're both members of Architects and Engineers for 9/11 Truth, the national organization. But I help co-found the Portland chapter of Architects and Engineers for 9/11 Truth. And I was just blown away by that clip. Every time I see it, with those handcuffs that administer taser and drugs, and they have GPS to say where you are, and they have a microphone to listen to you. I mean, yeah. you're. Yeah, that's just every cop should have several of those just to put them on people in general. Oh man, I, it. And if you've ever gone on YouTube or Google somewhere and check out all of DARPA's new mechanized robots, that they, they, they've got one that can step over obstacles and stuff and go over fences and think and where are they going to do that but in our urban areas oh well anyway you wonder why 9-11 is so important because it put them off on this you know this false hunt for terrorists that didn't exist now terrorists are under every bed instead of communists remember when communists were under every bed <laughs> now it's terrorists but that's all they're doing. They're using it to scare us and spending billions and billions and billions of dollars on things like those stupid handcuffs and robots to chase down people. Uh, but it, on the educational side, you have some information for people. Um, yes, if I'm not if they can put up the graphic for for the event. Yes, thank you so much. Um, so uh, oh, we just lost it. Okay. Well, so this is regarding. Um, there's a group in Portland that's called the Portland 9/11 Truth Alliance, and tomorrow they're having an event. Just hit the CG button, and it'll come in front of us. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Hit, hit the, yeah. If you want to say that again. Uh, so yeah. So tomorrow um, there's the event tomorrow evening at seven o'clock. Oh, oh, hold on. Oh, what? is it tomorrow? No, the 13th. Oh, sorry about that. I, I, I'm sorry. I thought I was... I, the 13th. I was wrong. Yes. Yeah, so... On, on so Sunday, January 13th. So um, we're eight days away. Yes, eight days away. Sorry about that. Uh, next weekend... Um, They'd have been early. This is for Barbara... <laughs> Honiger, I'm not sure if I'm saying her name right, her last name right, but this is a presentation, and she's giving a presentation on what happened at the Pentagon on 9-11, and this is at the Lucky Lab in Southeast Portland at 915 Southeast Hawthorne Boulevard. Uh, a, a $10 donation is recommended to cover the cost of the event, and again, this is being put on by the Portland 9-11 Truth Alliance, which is which is a local organization that goes... Well, they're, they're, they're very curious as to what, what the full breadth of what may have happened on 9-11, um, and this is again, this is regarding Barbara Honiger and what happened at the Pentagon on 9-11. Another clip uh, that we'll be putting up is regarding a different, a different organization that also deals with 9-11. This is Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth. And I helped co-found the Portland chapter of Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth. And there is our website, portlandae911truth.org. And we are going to be giving two library presentations in the Portland metro area every month this year. And so we, hopefully we'll be coming to a library near you. Um, our two libraries in January are on Tuesday, January 22nd, and Wednesday, January 23rd. On Tuesday, the 22nd is at, a, at, at the Hillsdale Library. And again, the address there is 1525 Southwest Sunset Boulevard, Portland, Oregon, 97239, if that helps you find it. And, on, and then on Wednesday, the 23rd, at the Belmont Library in Southeast Portland, so um, yeah, so we're 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 gonna try and have one on each side of the of the river um, every month this year, 
and please do come out and, and see us. And again, our website is portlandae911truth.org. We're, we're hopefully going to be having more, you know, more more featured presentations, or, or I should say more featured speakers, one or two featured speakers l later this year. Um, one of those being the co-founder of Architects and Engineers for Line and Truth. We'll hopefully have him in May or June or sometime around that time. But please do come out. Again, these are free library presentations. At the end of the presentation, um, this is featuring the DVD 9-11 Explosive Evidence Expert Speak Out. That's actually the DVD we'll be showing. Afterwards, we'll be having a Q&A. Um, and at the end of the Q&A, we'll be handing out free DVDs of what you just saw. And, and again, what we'll be showing is 9-11 Explosive Evidence Expert Speak Out. And we'll be giving out free DVDs again at the end of each of these library presentations. <coughs> Um, and, and at future library presentations throughout the year. Please do come out, um, especially if you're curious, and, um, and bring, a, bring somebody, you know, bring, bring somebody to also help, help inform them on the subject. Okay, now our group, uh, you know, although once in a while you hear this show engaging in, in speculation, we try to tell you that, you know, we consider this speculation and we're not trying to present it as evidence, but, um, so for the most part, especially AE 9-11 Truth and the Portland chapter as well, only wants to deal with evidence that we can present, that can be presented. But there are lots of other issues, I've got them right here, like, for instance, how the government lied about the factual dangers of the World Trade Center dust, how thousands of people were in fact hurt by the WTC dust, you know, um, what was her name, uh, the EPA lady? That yeah. Was, uh, I, can, I can picture her, but I can't. Yeah, I, we've talked about it for years, and now it's a blank. But anyway, she comes out after after initial reports of all the contaminants, including asbestos that was in the air. Uh, all of a sudden, she comes out uh, after bowing to pressure from the Bush administration to they wanted to open up Wall Street. It was more important than saving anybody else's lives, so they said the air was clean to, to breathe. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, I remember when those buildings <coughs> fell, and Boy. I saw the dust, and I thought to myself, "Holy moly!" I mean, just thinking about dust itself. Yeah, and then people were being allowed or, or being told to come back. Yeah, come back into the skyscrapers. It's fine. Go ahead and put the phone numbers up. Uh, I've got to get a glass of water. You want to talk about any of those things? Um. You... Oh well. Um. Uh, I'm kind of reading them as I'm as I'm yeah. talking about them. But um, th the next right in back. line that he Sorry, wanted, folks. <laughs> the next in line that he wanted to talk about is the whistleblower testimony of Secretary of Transportation. Norman Mineta, um, in which which in which he re reported about in which he reported to Dick Cheney. Okay, well that's second in line. Third is the lack of air defenses that day, including at the Pentagon. Uh, two or three are generally all I say. Okay, um, okay, yes. Yeah, so the third one, the third point being again the lack of air defenses that day, which really is like it took him an awfully long. It took him over an hour to get to get planes up, um, including at the Pentagon. And fourth in line that he wanted to mention was the whistleblower testimony of Secretary of Treasury, Paul O'Neill. He noted from day one it was about getting us into Iraq. He, um, his, and he opposed preemptive war. Um, and, he, and he was later canned by Dick Cheney. Um, we're on the fifth point right now, okay. which is regarding... The whistleblower testimonies of Kevin Ryan, April Gallup, Susan Lindauer, and Sibel Edmonds. Of course, I played a lot of stuff about Sibel Edmonds, and she just moved to Bend, Oregon, so she's got to be visiting Portland once in a while. I'm going to see if I can find out how to communicate with her and see if she'd like to come on this show. That would give this show a lot of class, but, I mean, even if she just consented to a Skype interview or something, it would be great. Yeah. And uh, well, and tell her about. The I don't care if this show has any class. I just want to bring people that really are meaningful to the art, to the to the information that we all need. And sh sh you know, Sabelle Edmonds particularly. Susan Lindauer is the CIA asset that reported that she saw, you know, uh, these unmarked vans coming in for the last two weeks between 3 a.m. and 5 a.m. And that's when they did the final hookup of all the explosives and she also testified that she was warned by her CIA handler not to go to Washington those last few weeks because the destruction was imminent. Well, anyway, along with that, this item six here, th by the way, I'm looking at 911blogger.com and, you know, it's an excellent source for uh, all kinds of different viewpoints because there are numerous people that 
write articles for it, including Kevin Ryan, who's another great source. Remember, Kevin Ryan was the NIST employee he, who got fired for telling the truth. <laughs> He said, but wait a minute, that steel won't melt like those guys. Said, shut up, shut up, you're fired. <laughs> oh, well. Anyway, um, but the attempts to discredit and marginalize whistleblowers speaks of conspiracy to cover up the facts regarding 9-11. I mean, if you really had any facts to support the official story, don't you think that you wouldn't need to come down on the people who are the so-called nutcases running around. They don't have, they wouldn't, if the official story was true, the nutcases wouldn't have any evidence to support it and they'd be known as nutcases. But if you ever listen to our evidence that we've discovered, we at least know that the official story doesn't hold any water whatsoever. Oh yeah, you want to talk about number seven? That's, that's the one we always bring up though, is that the people say, why would it how could our government kill that many people? They wouldn't do it. It would. It's evil. But we have a history. Yeah. So point seven on on our, on the list is the historical use of false false flag events by Germany, the U.S., and other and others for further political agendas. Um, the the big lie principle, if you will, and why many people hesitate to question ofi the the official narratives. Right. Because they really hammer you big. You know, you lose your job a lot of times. Every you know, virtually each one of the big name 9-11 people lost their official position after they started talking about 9-11. That's why people are so reluctant. And, and actually, this point is a good lead up back into um, the, um, you know, the free library presentations that we give, the Portland chapter of Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth. And again, the DVD that we show is entitled 9-11 Ex explosive evidence experts speak out and it's a really full breath uh, DVD it's um, using the scientific method um, we show you how three skyscrapers were brought down in New York City on 9-11 only two uh, of them were hit with planes yeah and most <laughs> people on the West Coast really only know about two of the skyscrapers falling they don't realize building seven fell um, among its tenants were really ma major tenants um, including the CIA and, and others, but um, really major tenants. And um, uh, anyway, so we again we we use um, we use the scientific method to show you um, how three buildings were brought down using explosives on the on 9/11. And um, yeah, and actually to to deal with um, how how people hesitate to question the official narrative about the last 18, 15 or 18 minutes of the DVD, we go through the. Um, uh, these professional psychologists really um, uh, remark on the on the on how on why it is that it's difficult for people to really accept these facts. You know, to help you, um, you know, really accept that explosives were actually used to bring down the buildings, and that you know, the, and that the official story really is is a lie, really. So now there's the, the next one is talking about the destruction of evidence. Um, oh, I, I skipped one, I guess, didn't I? Yeah. The, the, strange, <laughs> the strange coincidence that emergency gear and hundreds of personnel were assembled in Manhattan the day before. There was supposedly a FEMA drill going on that day, a disaster drill. What a coincidence involving the towers. I think it was, wasn't it? But it, either way, they were there one day early, just all assembled, ready to go. That's just another one of those unexplained coincidences. But, you know, that notwithstanding, what I started to talk about was the one that really matters is that before, I mean, it's against the law that to take any steps to take evidence away from a crime site. And that was definitely a crime site. And, and yet they shipped 99.5% of the steel to China. Now, the it, funny... It, it, that's, it, was, it, that's was like, it was like 400 truckloads a day. Something huge. It, it, it actually, in the film that we show, um, they, they, the, the actual amount of trucks is discussed. And you can see that the steel is cut into convenient lengths for trucking. And that wasn't done at the cleanup time. That was done when it fell. Because you can see those stacks just sitting there. Uh, well, anyway, the, uh, the good thing about keeping track, 99.5% was shipped to China. And that is evidence that you need to know when somebody starts talking to you about the directed energy weapons because they were supposedly responsible for vaporizing so much steel. They invented a new word that doesn't mean anything in science called dustification. 
and you know because she can't use a scientific word because we know what the scientific words mean there's exact definitions and if she uses a scientific word we could pin her down and say no no that's not what that is so Judy Wood invented a new word called dustification so she can define it and that is dustification look dustification means girders falling down on after the bottom was cut mysteriously but anyway her, her, so the point is if any of the steel had been vaporized first of all you'd find the evidence somewhere out there in the in the the air and the wood I mean the, the dust pile and all that but um, aside from that there'd be a big amount of that steel missing not being able to ship it to China because it's gone but that this according to this it leaves what half of one percent of the steel wasn't shipped to China that there's a bunch of it in some in the like the JFK hangar or JFK airport hangar 17 I think is where they're storing some steel I had the pictures that once in a while I put behind me um, so you know but half of 1% doesn't explain the, you know, the claims of the Judy Woods people that are talking about, you know, nearly a third of the steel has somehow been dustified. Well, yeah. that's just plain wrong. You know, that's, that's, I don't know if they're deliberately lying or if they just plain deliberately refuse to pay attention to the facts. But yeah, either way, yeah. it's being dishonest in their representation. I, I'd like to say that. I don't think they're mistaken. I think they're dishonest. Yeah, well, the, the, the founder of Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth w would call somebody like, like Judy Wood, Judy Wood, Judy Wood. Judy. Um, she, um, he, he would say about her that she's doing a, a, a great discredit right. to, to, to the real pursuit of truth behind There's no her, evidence really. to support her stories except you know, the way she, if you ever watch her work, what she does is she asks questions. What about this? Here's some cars that are burned on the top but not on the bottom. Why do you think that is? And that's how she proves that it had to be something else. Why? Well, we don't know. Therefore, I'm right. Okay. You know, what crummy logic. You know, it's just ridiculous. And you, and the people that support Judy Woods are not that smart either. Not as smart as that. And, and it's infuriating to talk to them. Well, anyway, okay, so, <laughs> I've so, been myself. So we're, so we're on point nine of, of the list of, ele of 11 things that he wanted to talk about. What, and what the phone lines are still open, by the way. Oh, yeah. If the anybody wants lines. to call in. But go ahead. But what was like the title of this list again? Because we're oh, like let me on, scan on, back on point nine. You. We're on point nine. Um, Reaching more people by broadening our discussion points. On, on the topic of 9-11. Yeah, okay. and, that's, and so this we're is on the point nine. 9 11 group talking. A A E nine eleven truth. See, remarkable group. It, well, that's we're, oh, yeah, yeah. we're talking. That one of the features that that we wanted to bring up, and that's point ten, is that architects and engineers for nine eleven truth, the membership has been growing by leaps and bounds. Not just the seventeen hundred plus architects and engineers, but over what fifteen thousand or seventeen thousand just ordinary people signed in to be supporters. And, you know, that's substantial amount of people, especially the architects and engineers who have actually put their reputations on the line because everybody's being dismissed as a nutcase and they're not being hired or they're being fired. And here these guys risk everything in their careers to come out and say, folks, listen to this. They're lying to us. And public polls, you want to take that one? <laughs> Um, and, and point 11 is that public polls show that larger numbers of the public question the official story of, of 9-11 and that we're making progress despite the opposition and that, and that other countries are really, and this is going beyond what, what, it, what, what I'm reading, but, that, um, but, but other countries are really helping, helping U.S. citizens to try and get um, our concerns regarding events like 9-11 to, um, to be highlighted, to be... To be um, to be brought into question into a court of law, even if it takes going into a court of law of, of another country. Oh, well, we are having a lot of things. The, I think that the, the International court? Criminal Court... Uh, oh, let's see. Who, who was it? Uh, I, I can't remember the, lawyer, the attorney's name. He was a former uh, attorney general, um, and he just brought out a list of 30 of our top... Uh, executives in our government that are guilty of war crimes including Obama including uh, 
Rumsfeld and Dick Cheney and George Bush and all those, and they're, I mean, serious war crimes. So, they're, I mean, for, since we're in charge of the, uh, I mean, we're one vote on, on that uh, United Nations Security Council, we have veto power. So we've always vetoed it whenever anybody has a legitimate complaint against us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. nice to be king. Yes, it is. <laughs> um, remember that the phone lines are open, so please feel free to call in. Yeah, now there's another thing to, to remember that after the cleanup, we began seeing tremendous diseases, breathing dysfunctions and cancers starting. The the dogs this, that were there helping the rescue effort are all dead from those contaminants. And so we have lots of first responders who are dying, and for the longest time they would not, none of the insurance companies would, would cover it. We, oh. Well, our, our our Portland chapter, we have we have one architect, our first architect um, who joined us, um, or our first female architect who joined us. Um, when when she when we were at the I believe the Gresham presentation, we gave a uh, we gave a couple of presenta free library presentations at the Gresham Library last year, and I believe at the Gresham presentation during the the week of nine eleven, um, she gave kind of she was kind of giving a, a, a moment of testimony on her part on on that day, and she said that. Um, I, at her job, she works as she works for OHSU as an architect, and um, th they had like a moment of, of pause on 9/11, you know, because it was on that day. And and she and one of the architects that was in the room with her said, um, somehow he he was working at a, at the office, um, in um, in Washington or near something about how he was kind of there when they helped suppress um, the evidence about all the contaminants and all in the dust particles and everything. Oh, that would be interesting to see that one. Um, yeah, I, I wish I had actually been able to have recorded her when she was when she was talking about what he'd said. But um, but yeah, I mean, it's just it's such, uh, you know, just like two degrees of separation, two or three degrees of separation from um, from certain information. But um, yeah, just like the cover up of even of, of the dust and um, all the poisons in the dust. Um, well, it doesn't, it doesn't look like we have callers. So I was gonna say control room, if you would, uh, I've got a, a 10 minute video here that Richard Gage just made and I'd like to play it. Nice. And this is Richard Gage, who's the founder of Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth. He's an architect outside of, uh, um, he's an architect in San Francisco. And we invited him to come last year twice, um, in March and in, in May, and we're gonna have him come again this year, hopefully around May. 11 explosive evidence. Sorry. And sorry. thank you for engaging with me in this critically important and controversial okay. subject. These students from my home state of California were upset about skyrocketing tuition costs last year, enough to want to practice civil disobedience. This is how they were treated. The police are using military grade pepper spray and were found in a one million dollar settlement to the students to have violated their first amendment right to peaceful protest. These types of extreme and violent measures have been used increasingly as a result of 9-11. Have you ever been mistreated? And when was the last time you trusted someone completely and then found out later that they were lying to you? Do you remember how it felt to be deceived? I do. Five years after 9-11, when I finally learned what really happened at the World Trade Center, I felt sick to my stomach. It also makes me sick to realize that we've lost a lot of our freedom because of 9-11. Freedoms that actually date back 800 years to the Magna Carta in England. Did you know that today you can be arrested without charge, without the right to a lawyer or a trial, held indefinitely, and even tortured? all because of 9-11. Well, maybe we should take a close look at 9-11. When I saw these towers coming down on TV, I was in shock, like most other Americans, and I automatically believed what the media was reporting about the cause of the collapses. My eyes were seeing one thing on TV, but my ears were hearing something else from the experts in the media. It was the combination of the impact load doing great damage to the building, followed by the fire that caused collapse. And the authorities prevailed because I wasn't engaging in critical thinking 
to deal with the discrepancies. For instance, did you know that two planes brought down three skyscrapers on 9-11? Most people, including architects and engineers, don't. The 9-11 Commission and the media didn't even tell us about the third worst structural failure in modern history. But I will. Watch. Have you seen buildings come down like this before? Like when they tear down the old hotels in Las Vegas. This is World Trade Center 7, a 47-story skyscraper not hit by an airplane, the tallest building in most of our states. Let's take a look compared to a known controlled demolition on the right and Building 7 on the left. Is there any similarity? Is there enough similarity to warrant an investigation into the possible use of explosives? Especially since every high-rise that has come down has been brought down with explosives and looks exactly like this. How fast is this building coming down? I'm going to drop this object. Mm -hmm. How fast does it fall? It falls at free fall acceleration. Why? Because there's no resistance under it, so it's falling freely. But there was 40,000 tons of structural steel under this building. In fact, 40,000 tons of structural steel that had to have been removed, synchronistically timed floor by floor, because that's how we get the building to fall straight down. Otherwise, it'll begin to tip over if that fraction of a second split second timing is not followed. Can fire, these fires, the worst fires which we have photographic or video evidence of, accomplish that level of precision? According to NIST, yes. NIST is the National Institute of Standards and Technology tasked with explaining these collapses. This is World Trade Center 5. It was fully engulfed with fire. Did it come down? No. Mid-rise, high-rise office fires do not bring down skyscrapers. These gentlemen heard explosions. There were many more. And what did these construction workers tell us? The building is about to blow up? How do they know? What did this first responder hear? At the last few seconds, he took his hand off, and you heard three, two, one. Do fires bring buildings down to countdowns? And how did the BBC report that this building came down 20 minutes before it actually did? They apologize for this grievous error. Does this make them psychic? What are the implications of World Trade Center 7 being a controlled demolition? Does that cast doubt on the official explanation of the Twin Towers? Let's take a look. First, a simple physics lesson. What happens when a Mack truck runs into a Volkswagen? The Mack truck wins, right? Does it matter if we drop the Volkswagen onto the Mack truck? No. The lighter part of a structure that's weaker cannot possibly destroy the heavier, stronger part. Take a look. The upper 12 stories of World Trade Center 1 is being destroyed in the first four seconds, just like a miniature controlled demolition. There's nothing left after four seconds to even destroy the rest of the building. And yet, look what's happening. An explosive geometry of pulverized building materials, laterally ejected, trailed by pyroclastic-like smoke clouds. Does it look anything like a gravitational collapse? Or does it look more like an explosive event? What did these gentlemen experience? We started running. Floor by floor, it started popping out. It was like, it was if, if they had detonated. Yeah, you know, detonated. They were planned yeah. to take down a building. Boom, 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 boom. All the way down. As a matter of fact, hundreds of first responders and others experienced explosions and reported them, yet none of these made it into the official reports. And what about the extreme heat produced? Listen to this. You'd get down below and you'd see molten steel. Like molten room. steel running down the channel rails. Like, like lava, lava from a volcano. Like lava from a volcano, like this molten metal pouring out of this debris. We can tell by the color that it exceeds 2,800 degrees, the melting point of steel or iron. What can produce those temperatures? Not fire, not jet fuel. They only get about half that temperature. 
Here's thermite, an incendiary used by the military to cut through steel like a hot knife through butter, issuing 4,000 degree molten iron as its byproduct and fully capable of destroying steel structures, like which was done in World Trade Center 7, documented by officials, melting of steel and partially evaporating. What was found in all the World Trade Center dust? Residue of thermite, in this case molten iron spheres, and partially ignited thermite chips found by independent researchers. Did you know that the structural steel from the buildings, evidence from a crime scene, was illegally destroyed starting just two weeks after 9-11, shipped to China for recycling before investigators could even look at it? Now, all of this is just the tip of the iceberg of this evidence. Do you think that it might be important? Incredibly, most of it was not even included in the 9-11 Commission report or shown on TV. We gave them an F. Obviously, the implications are huge. After all, if we weren't told the truth about 9-11, and 9-11 was supposed to be the reason that we invaded two countries, then what in the hell was really going on here? Well, I can tell you this. 1,700 architects and engineers are blowing the whistle on 9-11. If that many technical and building professionals told you that your house was in danger of collapse, would you listen to them? On your campus, we'll present not speculation or conjecture, but the hard scientific facts and evidence and the key steps to critical thinking like we did at the University of Maryland. Very compelling, very captivating, and I believe that the student body at the University of Maryland benefited a lot from having you here. These students learned that it's dangerous for all of us when we let others do our thinking for us. We have to get back our critical thinking in this country. If we do, we might be able to prevent the next 9-11. Critical thinking helps you to chart your own course instead of blindly following others, peers, the media, and authority figures like politicians who just might have an agenda of their own. It's up to you to expose the dark truth about 9-11 because most everyone else has dropped the ball. We let the civil liberties that were handed to us be taken, consumed in the aftermath of 9-11. We can't allow the truth about 9-11 to be swept under the rug of history. The price is too high. I'm Richard Gage. Come visit us for the 9-11 explosive evidence and don't let your campus be the last to know. Oh, yeah, I was gonna say, we only got a minute left before we're off the air and that's an excellent production. Richard Gage is really getting good at giving you the points. To, I mean, when he says something, it just makes sense. Um, yeah, and, and don't forget to go to portlandae911truth.org for the next free library presentation of his DVD, which is entitled 9-11 Explosive Evidence Experts Speak Out. Again, portlandae911truth.org. And if you're just a little too lazy for that and don't get around to it, I'm going to try to redo it again. I, re I, I sponsored it, and it was broadcast here once before, yeah, yeah. and they use it as filler once in a while. I saw it over the uh, Christmas holiday. It, they did it late at night sometime, but... Still, you you know. If you come to one of our pre free library presentations, we'll give you a free DVD. There you so, go. So you get you a free copy. It, yeah. So if you don't see it with him, you know, come come to us. Come to our Q and A. You know. Oh, it'll be a month before it's on the way they grind things through here. But I'll start today, and you'll see it in a month. Wow. <laughs> oh well. <laughs> I should have been watching that. Yeah. I, I'm always watching the last seconds. <laughs> Good for you. Oh well. Excellent, though, man. I like it. probably clips. frustrated them with me keeping on talking. Shut up, Bill. We're going out. Yeah. Okay. Well, anyway, I, awesome. how do you like this thing? This is a thousand gigabyte. I know you, you were showing off of that last time, and I want to forget. And it was like a really good price too. Here, I love it. Here's love what it. I wanted to show. I, I want to get one. Uh, let's see. Let me get this all out of here. Figure out how to do it. Come on. Where's my escape button? There it is.